Hi, welcome back. You ready to talk some Bitcoin? In the last week, Bitcoin hit new highs. That's stating the obvious because it's been doing that for the last few years. And in fact, in the last week, it went over $6,000 per Bitcoin. And the question I've been asked over and over again the last few weeks, especially as I've been traveling through Latin America, is what do I think Bitcoin is worth? What's the value of Bitcoin? In this session, I'd like to explain why I don't think Bitcoin can ever be valued and why you cannot invest in Bitcoin. Those sound like strong words, but it's really nothing to do with Bitcoin. It's about how I think about Bitcoin, what kind of investment it is. So let's set the table. If you look at the chart, Bitcoin's clearly been an incredible success. The price has risen and risen, as I said, it went over $6,000 last week. Though it's dropped back since, this has been an incredible ride. For those of you who invested in Bitcoin early, congratulations, you made a lot of money. But in this session, I'd like to talk about where those profits came from and why they might disappear. So let's set the table. When I look at an investment, the first thing I need to do is categorize the investment. I don't do it because I'm fixated on categories, but without categorizing an investment, I really don't know what the next step to take is. In fact, I categorize investments into four groups. The first are cash flow generating assets. What do those include? You start a business, clearly you have a cash flow generating asset. You give me a claim against those cash flows, either a fixed claim, which takes the form of bonds, or a residual claim, which is equity. I still have a cash flow generating asset. It might even be a contingent claim. If something happens, I will get a cash flow. That is still a cash flow generating asset. And that, of course, is an option. So first grouping of assets are cash flow generating assets. The second grouping of assets is commodities. Commodities are useful because they can be utilized to create something we need. Oil creates energy. Agricultural products, wheat, is food. So commodities get their use from some fundamental need that they can be used to meet. The third grouping of investments is currencies. Currencies can be used to denominate cash flows. They're a medium of exchange. I can use them to buy stuff and sell stuff. And they're a store of value. I hold them, I hold whatever I don't invest in elsewhere in currencies and hope they preserve their purchasing power. And finally, you have collectibles. Collectibles don't have a utilitarian need like commodities do. They have no cash flows. And they, they really are not used to even denominate other assets. They have value because they're viewed as scarce and desirable. That combination of scarcity and desirability creates, value for, uh, creates a price for collectibles. So a painting has a price because we think the painting is a, is, is a good painting, something we think is, is, is attractive. And at the same time, it's viewed as scarce. So those are the four groupings of investments. And the reason I group them is I'm going to follow up and argue that each of these groupings has a different treatment waiting for it. If you give me a cash flow generating asset, I can value it. How can I value it? Based on the cash flows. I don't have to bring out my heavy ammunition. So don't view this as a sales pitch for a discounted cash flow model. But more generically, if you have a cash flow generating asset, its value is a function of its cash flows. And the higher and more stable the cash flows, the greater the value. So you can value a cash flow generating asset. Can you price a cash flow generating asset? Absolutely. We do it all the time with stocks. We use a standardized price where we divide the price by some measure of earnings or cash flows, PE ratio, EV debit, and we compare those pricing, that pricing across similar assets. And that, of course, is subjective, but we might compare software companies to each other. So cash flow generating assets can be both valued and priced. Commodities can be valued, but the valuation is much more difficult because it's a function of long-term demand, which is a function of how much the commodity is used to fulfill a need and how much that need is growing, and long-term supply. That long-term supply and long-term demand comes with long lead times and lag times, which means even if you value commodity, it might take several years for that value to unfold. Commodities can be priced. Usually they're priced against their own history. So when I ask you whether an oil price is high or low, what you do is you look at the historical oil price or a normalized coal price. So commodities can be priced often against their own history. So value much, it's much more difficult to value a commodity than a cash flow generating asset, but it can be done and it can definitely be priced. Let's move to currencies. Currencies cannot be valued. 
dollar does not create more cash flows by itself. Currencies don't create cash flows. They can't be valued as cash flows. They don't fulfill any particular need. So for instance, paper currency doesn't let me, maybe I can set fire to it if I'm cold, but it doesn't meet any fundamental need. It really is a measure of, it's, it's basically a medium of exchange and a store of value. So you can price currencies, you can't value them, you can price them against each other. You might ask, what causes the price to change over time? If a currency becomes more widely accepted as a medium of exchange and holds its purchasing power better than another currency, that currency should become more highly priced relative to the second one. So if you look across very long time periods at what currencies have strengthened and weakened against a US dollar, the currencies that have strengthened against the US dollar tend to be currencies from either countries that have shown incredible growth and therefore greater acceptance of currency like the Chinese yuan, or currencies where the inflation rate is much lower than the US like the Swiss franc. The currencies that are weakened against the US dollar tend to be currencies that have either higher inflation or have had lower acceptance, less acceptance over time. And finally, you have collectibles. Collectibles definitely cannot be valued. You can't value a Picasso, but you can price it, but very carefully. What drives the pricing of a, uh, of a collectible are two things. One is its perceived attractiveness by others, not by you, and its scarcity. That's the reason prices can shift fairly dramatically on collectibles, because the perceived attractiveness changes from one period to the other. The pricing can change as well. So with that setup, let's talk about the difference between trading and investing. This is a contrast I've drawn before, but I want to revisit it. When you invest in an asset, here's what you do. You value the asset, you compare the value to the price. If the value is greater than the price, you buy and you hold. For how long? Until the price adjusts to the value. What makes you good at investing are two things. Your, accept, your capacity to value an asset and your patience in holding on till the price adjusts to the value. So what makes you a good investor is essentially having those characteristics and having the faith to wait it out. If you're a good trader, you're playing a much simpler game. You don't care about value. You buy at a low price and sell at a high price. You're saying, does it matter why the price increases? Not really, because you make money either way. So as a trader, you build on mood and momentum. You don't care about cash flows, growth and risk. You're trying to detect shifts in momentum. The toolkit that you bring to the game is very different than the toolkit that an investor brings to the game. An investor might do an intrinsic valuation, might look over accounting statements. You can look over charts. There's nothing wrong with looking over charts if your game is the momentum game. What makes for a good trader is very different from what makes for a good investor. Traders play the pricing game, but they're trying to detect which way the price is moving. Investors play the value game, and already you can see that this contrast is going to lead you to make a strong statement about Bitcoin. You cannot invest in Bitcoin. You can trade in Bitcoin. Nothing wrong with it. I'm not attaching a value judgment to trading, but it is a pricing game. It's a pure pricing game. With that set up, let's talk about Bitcoin. What is it? It's clearly not a cash flow generating asset. It is clearly not a commodity. So it's either a currency or a collectible. The people who are the strongest supporters of Bitcoin viewed as a currency, the People who are the strongest detractors of Bitcoin viewed as a collectible. If it is a currency, then you have to price it as a currency. And, it, and I believe it is really a currency and it should be priced as a currency, which means its pricing should be determined by how well it's behaving as a currency. And here's where I have an issue with Bitcoin. Bitcoin's pricing in the marketplace seems to take it as a foregone conclusion that it succeeded as a currency. But on the ground, in terms of people taking Bitcoin in transactions as a currency, it's not done very well. If it's a currency, it's not a very good one yet. Notice I'm not saying it'll never be a good one. It's not a good one yet because it's not, not widely accepted as a medium of exchange. And it's much too volatile to be a store of value. In other words, I don't want to take my entire savings and hold it in Bitcoin because its pricing can jump 20% in a day in either direction. Bitcoin is a currency, but not a very good one. So what next? Whether you think Bitcoin is correctly priced or not depends on what kind of currency it will eventually become. And here are the three scenarios. The first and most optimistic scenario is that Bitcoin becomes a global digital currency, a currency we can use in any part of the world that's accepted widely in transactions. 
and it is it, it is become stable enough that you can actually use it as a store of value. That's your best case scenario is it becomes a competitor to the US dollar, the euro, the Japanese yen, a global digital currency. For that to happen though, Bitcoin has to settle down. It cannot have a price as volatile as it, as it does and it has to focus on transactions. Okay. The second path is the gold path. What is that? Until about 30 years ago, maybe even 20 years ago, maybe even 15 years ago, if you were worried about, if you were, if you like, if you were in a crisis, you lacked faith in paper currency, you lost faith in central governments and central banks, what you did was you took your money out of paper currency and you held gold. Gold was a currency only in the sense that you went to it because you didn't trust paper currencies. It was not a very good currency in terms of medium of exchange because carrying gold around with you, it's not easy to do transactions, but it was a store of value. And it's had incredible staying power. And if you look at the terminology of Bitcoin, you can almost see that the original promoters of Bitcoin saw this as an end game for Bitcoin, that it could become the new gold, the goal for the millennials. So if you're a millennial, a bit paranoid, lacking trust, hey, Bitcoin is the place to go. And if this is the scenario that unfolds, Bitcoin could become the new gold with all of gold's pluses and minuses. Gold's plus is an incredible staying power. The minus is its pricing is determined by how much faith or trust you have in, the, in governments and banks. So its price is going to go up and down depending on whether you're in crisis or out of crisis. There's a third and pretty unpleasant scenario, and that Bitcoin is just a passing fad. That it's a currency for the moment, not a widely accepted currency because it's a, it, people are caught up with it. But to the extent that it doesn't have staying power, five years from now, ten years from now, people will move on to some other investment. It could be another cryptocurrency, it could be some other investment, and Bitcoin could be left in the ashes. It could become today's version of the tulip bulb. If you remember in the 1600s, tulip bulbs became incredibly pricey investments in Holland, not because people love tulip bulbs, but because it became the equivalent of something you could put your money on. You have to hope and pray if you're a Bitcoin promoter that you're not this generation's tulip bulb. So those are the three pathways, and I'd be lying if I knew which one will unfold because all three are plausible. If you believe Jamie Dimon, he of course seems to believe the tulip bulb pathway. But I don't see it as foregone. I think Bitcoin has a chance to become a digital currency, but the people promoting it have to focus on the transaction side. Make it easier for me to leave my house with Bitcoin in my pocket, and I think you'll create a pathway for Bitcoin to justify its price. Here's the bottom line though. If you accept my proposition that Bitcoin is a currency, Let's stop talking about cryptocurrencies as an asset class and arguing that investors need to set aside a certain portion of money in cryptocurrencies. And this is not just a hit against Bitcoin. I would say the same thing about US dollars. The US dollars is not a, an asset class. You shouldn't be carving out a portion of your portfolio and say, I'm going to put it in US dollars because it's not an asset class. You cannot value Bitcoin. So let's stop talking about what the value of Bitcoin is. It, does, it cannot be valued because it's not an asset. It will ultimately be judged as a currency. So in the short term, mood and momentum might carry it, but in the long term, its value, its pricing will less rest on how good it becomes as a currency. You don't invest in Bitcoin, you trade it. And what will make you a good trader is you can detect shifts in mood and momentum. So don't let hubris lead you to think that you've somehow valued Bitcoin well, even if you've made money, you've been a good trader. Bring the good trader mentality to Bitcoin. Make it all about detecting mood and momentum. Don't get distracted by, by talk about fundamentals, but keep your eye on the price. It has to eventually succeed as a currency. What's the bottom line here? Would I buy Bitcoin at 6000 or 5600 No, but not for the reasons you think. It's not because I think Bitcoin is overvalued. I can't make that statement because I don't know what the value of Bitcoin is. It cannot be valued. It's because I'm a terrible trader. I'm horrible at detecting shifts in mood and momentum. And if you're bad at shift, is detecting shifts in mood and momentum, you have no business being in this market. And I have no business being in the market. I'm not going to talk you out of being in this market. If you're good, if you have good trading instincts and you can work with mood and momentum, detect shifts in it, by all means, put your money in Bitcoin, but do, do it with open eyes. If you make a lot of money, good luck to you. You are a good trader. If you make, lost a lot of money, don't make this a conspiracy and blame the establishment, the status quo, the central banks and Jamie Dimon. 
This is a pricing game. You win sometimes, you lose sometimes. Come easy, go easy. Thank you very much for listening.